Hello everybody, my name is Nathaniel McCollum. Uh, I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat and I'm going to be talking about secure automated decryption. Uh, I would ask for you to bear with me a little bit. Uh, my talk and slides are actually hosted on a hosting provider and apparently their whole data center went down. They had uh, like massive catastrophic power failures. And, uh, but fortunately, they actually are piping the recovery process live right on, the, right on their blog. So you can actually see they, this is what they're getting. The way there's, there's more. <coughs> okay, now obviously my example is a little bit facetious, uh, but it is a real world problem, right? Uh, and that is as we start to deploy decryption at scale, the question is how do we automate this process? Uh, because we can't do it uh, in the manual way we've been used to doing it in the past. Uh, but with automation also comes new security challenges. So the, uh, the, talk, the title of this talk, of course, is Secure Automated Decryption. And we are going to be talking about uh, the various different methods that are used. So the first question we're going to come to is, can we automate this? And of course, the answer is yes. Uh, first, we have this, uh, this secret here. This is the data we want to protect. And usually the way this is, this is guarded is we first encrypt it with an encryption key. Now this is not the key that you use directly, so this is not the password, for instance, that you type. Uh, this is a cryptographically strong key that protects the data. And then what we actually do is we encrypt the encryption key in another key called the key encryption key. Okay, and this wrapping process or sealing process, all of these terminologies refer to the same thing, uh, basically allow you to change the outer key without having to change the inner key. Right? Because if you have terabytes worth of data, you don't want to have to change that inner key and then re-encrypt all your data. Uh, so, and if, or if you have a vulnerability in the outer key, you can simply change the outer key, re-encrypt the inner key, and your data is protected. So the t this is where your typical password comes in. Right? You have uh, a password, and that's actually the key encryption key, usually derived in some, some sense. And this is sort of the standard password model. Of course, we distributed that to all these different people, and now all of these people have access to the data, and then one of them leaves the company, and you can't manage that, right? So we have a whole automation um, problem there. Uh, an even better option would be, of course, to, to generate something that has a lot more entropy uh, for the outer key. And then we sort of have a standard escrow model. And this is what you're typically seeing deployed in a lot of places. This is actually showing up in standards. Uh, it's showing up in various different tech proposals. And uh, even there's some regulations that are talking about this sort of escrow model. So we're done, right? We've described uh, automa secure automated decryption. We can all go home, right? <laughs> well, not quite. Because the problem is we actually also have to protect the transport layer. Um, so we have uh, TLS or GSS API, which we're using to encrypt uh, the transfer of the key from the escrow uh, back to the uh, server that's or the client that's going to perform the decryption. <coughs> and of course, this is secured by a key on each end because you have to have authentication. Now that the key is being stored in the escrow, you can't just let anybody get that key, right? So the server has to prove who it is or the client has to prove who it is in order to get the key from the escrow. Uh, and so now you have mutual authentication on both ends. So at least finally we're done, right? No, so there's actually more process, right? Because in order to generate the keys for authentication, we have to have a third party authority. Uh, which uh, is usually in the form of, if you're using GSS API, it's like a KDC, for instance, Active Directory. Uh, or if you're using certificates for TLS, you have a certification authority. So now we're done. Unfortunately, no, because remember, we're storing all of this data now in the escrow, so we still have to back up all of this data. And uh, key data is kind of sensitive, so you don't want to just back it up in clear text. So uh, now you also have the heartbeat problem, that we are transferring all of these keys over the wire, and all of a sudden our TLS uh, is completely useless to help us. Okay, so this is sort of the model that everybody's doing, and we recognize that there are some security challenges with it, and we wanna see, we're gonna gradually unfold some different methodologies, and we're gonna see what we can do to solve these problems. So let's quick review some of our lessons we've learned. Uh, first one is that complexity increases the attack surface, right? So every time we added a little bit of complexity in that escrow model, we added another place to fail, 
another place to, to lose keys, right? Uh, <clears throat> this is also difficult to deploy, and uh, we also learned that, that speed matters. Uh, if, if you think in the case of a database, in the example I gave right at the beginning of this talk, if you've got a, a, a data center full of thousands of machines all coming up at the same time, all wanting keys, right, speed matters. So, can asymmetric crypto help? And the answer is actually yes. Uh, we started a project called Deo. Uh, this was actually uh, last year. And uh, essentially what we did was we decided that we would take the key encryption key and encrypt that again using a public key encryption and then just store it locally. Okay, so the, encrypted, the key encryption key is encrypted again using asymmetric crypto and stored locally. Then during recovery time when we want to get the key back, we would send the encrypted blob to the server and we would get back the plain, the plain text key. Now this had some really nice advantages in terms of uh, statefulness because it was not stateful. Uh, we could actually store the data locally. The server didn't need to know all this, all this data. Um, <coughs> but we still did have to authenticate the connections and, uh, and we had to protect the channel, of course, because we were transferring the key back in, in plain text. We had to protect the channel. We still have the certification authority. We still have the backups issue. And uh, we did learn some lessons from this project. Uh, we learned that asymmetric crypto makes the server stateless, which is probably the most important thing that we can learn from this. Um, asymmetric crypto also allows for offline provisioning, which has some really interesting use cases, say, when you're trying to speed up uh, deployment, you want to bring up you know, thousands of servers quickly to handle some load, uh, you can actually do the entire provisioning offline because you don't need to contact the server for anything as long as the client knows the, the uh, server's public key. Uh, we also learned that sending the keys over the wire is still a risk, and we also learned that X509 takes a lot of effort, and this is in fact, uh, the last item is the reason why we killed the project. Uh, we, we designed it, we implemented it, it was fairly simple and it worked. Uh, but a lot of people had a lot of difficult time deploying it just around the management of X509 certificates. And so we wanted to see if we could uh, do better. So let's ask some more questions. Uh, first, can we avoid TLS altogether? Uh, because TLS is a pretty complex stack. Uh, we still are going to need to use encryption, of course, because we do need to keep things uh, secret. But if we can limit all of the options that TLS gives us in which we could fail down to just a few manageable options, uh, we have a much smaller attack surface. Uh, the second question is, can we hide the key from the server so that the server itself never sees the key? And we can. So we're going to use uh, a mode that I like to call wrapping mode. So if you go back, remember that, that donut circle, the outer one, the key encryption key, is, is now in the middle of this. So what we do is we create another symmetric key called the wrap key, and then we encrypt that blob using the server key. <coughs> then we uh, keep the, the resulting encrypted blob, and we keep the wrap key. But notice that because the client does not have the server's private key, it cannot decrypt this material. So once you've encrypted the, the volume using the key encryption key, you throw away the key encryption key, and then you don't have it anymore, and you need to get it back. So then at recovery time, what you do is you generate a second key called the ephemeral key. And you encrypt this again using the server key. So we have two layers, uh, actually have multiple layers of encryption. We have the, the uh, key encryption key in the middle, wrap key is encrypted, is used to encrypt that. The server's asymmetric key is used to encrypt that. Then we have the, that blob plus the ephemeral key in another layer of encryption. And then we can send this to the server over the wire without TLS. Now the server is going to get this big packet and it has its own server's private key so it can use that to decrypt both layers and get the uh, encrypted key encryption key uh, which it still can't see, it can only see the encrypted part, right? And it has the ephemeral key. So then it takes the ephemeral key, encrypts the resulting blob and then sends it back to the client. The client, of course, has both keys. So now the client can simply unwrap the ephemeral key, unwrap the wrap key, and get back the key encryption key and perform decryption. And so what we've just done now is we've accomplished two things. First, we have completely obviated the need for TLS. We don't need TLS at all. We can just send this over a UDP packet if we want. And, uh, and then the second thing is that the, the server only saw an encrypted blob. 
Okay, it never actually saw the, the actual key encryption key, uh, which is a really nice feature because it means that uh, if somebody can't just sit there and collect uh, keys. They can collect the, the encryption blobs, uh, but then they would also have to compromise the client in order to, uh, to get the wrap key. So this is a pretty good model. Um, we like this overall. It's one of the, it has a lot of nice features. The server never sees the key, the key encryption key. We avoid X509, we avoid TLS. It's stateless and it's fast. So these are all really great things. Um, one of the things I didn't put on here is that uh, this method is actually very easy to migrate to post quantum crypto, right? Because this is one of the major concerns that's coming up uh, is how we move to a post quantum crypto world. And this is very straightforward to move. We just, you know, AES, for instance, and symmetric keys are not part of post-quantum crypto. We believe these to be secure. Uh, quantum computers don't, don't hurt anything. It's only the public keys, right? So as long as we get some kind of public key encryption in post-quantum crypto, we, we're fine to use this model and it will continue to work in the future. But still we believe we can, we can accomplish some other features as well. Uh, number one, must the key actually go on the wire? And number two, can clients be anonymous? And the reason we're asking this question, remember the, the server in the last example never saw the key encryption key, but it still saw a blob, an encrypted blob that didn't change. Okay, so it could use that encrypted blob for tracking of clients, for instance. Uh, but one of the questions we wanted to ask uh, is, is, can we do the secure automated uh, decryption that is more ephemeral, uh, in which you could you know, just be walking around and have access to an access point, for instance, and be able to transiently decrypt some data without that server even knowing who you are, not having any idea. So we actually can do this as well. This is standard LMR encryption. And if anyone dies for fear of math, uh, I don't blame you. Um, <coughs> standard LMR encryption, uh, there's nothing fancy about this. Uh, but what uh, a guy at Red Hat and myself, uh, Bob Relier, uh, we came up with a variant of this. So notice that on the left-hand side, I'm going to go back. Nothing actually changes okay, on the left-hand side. We're only changing the decryption step here. And using this algorithm, we come up with a couple interesting properties. Um, the first is that the server only ever sees random data all the time. It's random all the time. So the server never gets anything static that it can identify the client with. The client is completely anonymous. And because this is a key exchange, not, if not encryption, uh, we are essentially never sending the key over the wire. So it's like a diffie hump. Okay? So this is even has some better security properties. And uh, we have a server called Tang over here on the right. And essentially, we take the key encryption key, and we just use the key exchange to generate a key encryption key, which we can always then re regenerate uh, automatically. Uh, we still kind of need backups here. Uh, but we can avoid backups by using TPM and actually just burning the private keys into the chips. Uh, and in this case, uh, you burn the server's private key into the chip, the server becomes completely stateless. Uh, there's literally nothing stored on the hard drive, nothing backed up, and you can't recover the key. So uh, you can do this in a very, very minimal footprint. So uh, we're, we've been even toying with ideas like little Bluetooth beacons, right? Where you could have data that's encrypted on your phone, and when you're in range of Bluetooth beacon, you can decrypt it, and when you walk away, you can't. So very, very lightweight, very, very small, very, very fast. So we have a project that implements this. Uh, the project is called Tang. And uh, you can see this organization latch set. Uh, you're going to see this pretty frequently. This is uh, an organization that several of uh, the crypto guys uh, in Red Hat have created. And it has various cryptography related projects. So even besides the stuff we're going to talk about here, just go browse it. It's got some interesting stuff. Uh, so this is the server side daemon. Uh, it's simple HTTP and uh, Jose. Anybody know what Jose is? Uh, anybody know JSON Web Encryption? Ever heard that? JSON Web Encryption, JSON Web Signing. Jose is uh, JSON Object Signing and Encryption. Okay? So the, the, uh, the nice thing about this is that we're using completely standard formats. This is a standard HTTP request, and this is a standard JSON Encryption Object. So nothing, nothing proprietary here, no, no funny structures. Um, this is really, really fast. 
So uh, I was able to benchmark with a single TCP connection, uh, we can just, you know, just cramming requests in the server. On a standard desktop laptop, you can get about 100,000 requests a second, which is sufficient for low power hardware, it's sufficient for, uh, you know, for large scale deployments. Uh, so we're extremely fast, we're extremely small, small and we have minimal dependencies. Um, our only server side dependencies are uh, HTTP parser, which is just a small HTTP parsing library, really tiny, it's two files. And then um, the library, which we're going to talk about at the end of this talk, uh, for doing the Jose encryption. So let's continue asking some more questions. Uh, what other things can we bind our data to? Right? We've, we've already mentioned this sort of standard escrow case where you've got a client and a server. But really, we kind of developed some new technologies here. So let's, let's think more broadly about what other kinds of endpoints we could actually bind our data to. Uh, obviously, TPM is one where you could actually bind data to your local TPM. You could uh, bind it to a Bluetooth beacon, which I mentioned. You could do something like, say, generate a random key and then print a, a QR code, and then when you need to access it, you just hold the QR code up to the camera. You could do facial recognition, fingerprint scan, mobile phones, smart cards, RFIDs, all these different kinds of endpoints that you can actually bind the data to. And uh, one of the things, this, is, this quote is from Josh Brushers uh, from his security talk at DevConf, and I love this quote. I keep coming back to it over and over again. Security is not a binary. It's a sliding scale of risk management. But very often in cryptography, we just deal with the binary, right? Is it secure or is it not? And in fact, uh, allowing us to have multiple things which we bind to allows us to have a sliding scale of risk management. So, the question is how do we make our unlock policy non-binary? Well, there's this great little algorithm uh, called Shamir Secret Sharing. Uh, anybody know who Shamir is? He's the S in RSA. Okay. Uh, so he made this algorithm called Shamir Secret Sharing and it's a thresholding algorithm. It allows you to take a key and you can essentially split it up into, into five different parts, which I've shown here. Uh, the number of parts is, it could be any number, uh, depending on your key size. And then you have a threshold. And basically, your threshold determines how many of these key fragments are required in order to regenerate uh, the resulting key. You can also nest this, right? So you have a key here that's fragmented, and then you can take that middle key and you can fragment it again with a separate threshold. So we're going to use this technique to design non-binary security policy. So we have a simple laptop, right? And uh, now I'm not talking about your home laptop here. We're talking about something that's a corporate deployed laptop. Uh, and typically, you're going to have the user decryption password, but you're also going to want to have an admin password so that for whatever reason, if the user can't get into their system, the admin can get into it, right? So in this case, uh, with Lux, you can just use multiple slots. But if we translate this into Shamir's language, we can do a threshold of one, and we divide it up into two fragments. And we have the admin password and the user password. And so the user password, the user can type in his or her password, and because the threshold is one, that is sufficient to unlock the system. Same for the admin. Now we can automate this process, right? Because we can stick the tag server we talked about as one of our endpoints, and we still have a threshold of one. So now when the, when the user brings in their laptop to work, they turn it on at work, uh, they get on the network, and then the disk decrypts automatically because they're on the corporate network, they have access to the Tang server, and everything just continues automatically. Uh, but if they're at home or a coffee shop, then they can use the, the user password or the admin can use the admin. admin so the, if you're going to do that, you've got to have the network stack loaded before you decrypt. Sure. This, <coughs> this doesn't just all magically work right. because I put it on a slide. <laughs> I wish it was that easy, unfortunately. Um, but yes, um, we already do have network stack in early boot, mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, I'm going to show you a demo of this at the end. Um, th that comes with some complications. Uh, we don't currently have wireless in the, you know, the early stack, so we're bringing this up in stages, and we'll we'll see how far we can take it. Yeah. Which would be then. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we have options here, but we're still trying to bring up the infrastructure, we're still trying to bring up the protocols. Once we get these protocols up and established, we can really start to look at some of these other avenues. So this is the standard sort of automated laptop case, right? But let's start to get a little bit more esoteric. Let's imagine now that we have a system that really needs to be secure, right? We've got uh, nuclear launch codes on it, okay? Now, we don't want to just have one password that we share out with all the people. Right? Instead, we want to have three distinct passwords for which two of them are required. Right? You both got to turn the key to blow up the world kind of scenario. Uh, so that here, in this case, two different users have to enter a password uh, in, order to, uh, in order to be able to get in. So let's look at now a complex theoretical laptop policy. So in this case, we have our first level, uh, which has a threshold of one. And it has a QR code. And this is sort of the master recovery key, right? So IT is provisioning this laptop. And they, they uh, generate a, a cryptographically strong random key. They print it in a QR code. And they lock it in a safe. And, and it's only ever used for disaster recovery. Uh, so that one has a threshold of one. Because if they show the QR code, you want them in, no, no matter what. But now we drop to another level of Shamir's. Here we have a threshold of two, okay? <clears throat> and in this case, we're bound to TPM as well, as well as another subtree. And this means that both are actually required. So in this case, in, in the first case with the QR code, they can take the laptop out of the hard drive and use the QR code to get back into the disk. But in all of the remaining cases, the disk has to be in the chassis because it's bound to the TPM and there's a threshold of two, so that means TPM is required. Now we drop down to a, another threshold. And we have four options here. Uh, password, fingerprint, tang, and Bluetooth. And in these four cases, two of them are required. So you can now imagine that we have a sliding scale of security. So if I'm, again, in, at my desk, and I have a Bluetooth beacon right within range of my desk, and I'm on the corporate network, and I have access to tang, I fulfilled my two requirements completely automatically. On the other hand, I take my laptop, and I walk into a conference room, I still have access to the corporate network, so I can get to 10, but I'm out of range of the Bluetooth beacon now, right? So in this case, I just scan my fingerprint, and I get in. But now I take my laptop, and I walk out of the building into an even less secure environment, and uh, when I walk out of the building, I go down to the local coffee shop, and I try to get into my data, and in this case, uh, we need two again, so I use my pass password and my fingerprint. So you can see now that we've used this complex structure in order to synthesize, essentially, a real-world environment. Because we've identified that near my desk, yeah, that's a really secure environment. Uh, when I walk away from my desk, it's a little bit less secure, but we can still have some automation and some easy access. Uh, but when I'm in a completely unsecure environment, like a coffee shop, uh, in that case, I have to use the strongest uh, level of authentication in order uh, to get access. So, does this make sense to everybody? Have I explained it well? Yes. Now, just think about your normal life. This is precisely the way you work. And in fact, I like to, to call this essentially a neural network for encryption, right? Because that's, that's sort of what it is. Um, the way we sort of work in our own brains, we walk into an environment that we don't know, we don't know what it is, but we pick, we piece together by the clues that are around us, and we do this subconsciously. Uh, that, you know, that I'm in danger or I'm not. And we have these uh, feelings of comfort or relaxation if we're in a safe environment or, or a feeling of, uh, you know, of elevated uh, stress in, in, in an environment uh, which, is, which is not secure. And so essentially what we're trying to do here is we're trying to synthesize the way that humans actually behave uh, in order to uh, create a security policy around that. So we're essentially emulating uh, human behavior. And here's the key point I would like to leave us with. Uh, we still have a couple more things to talk about, but, but we're, we're coming into home stretch. Uh, let business policy drive the crypto policy and not vice versa. Right? So we're trying to create a flexible system, uh, one in which uh, the person who's actually deploying this can create the policy. It's very easy for us to create one or two policies that we think are very good, uh, but that doesn't let the business policy drive the crypto policy. It means that a crypto engineer has designed the crypto policy. Um, and there are ways we can be more flexible here. So the, uh, the project that implements this, is, which is the client side, is called Plevis. 
and it's client-side pluggable key management. Currently, we have uh, three plugins. <coughs> we have HTTP, which supports the traditional escrow model. Because we have a lot of people that use this, and they're going to want to migrate uh, slowly away. And there are some cases, perhaps, where our regulation might require them to use a res an escrow model. Uh, so the, basically, this just does an HTTP put against the URL and does an HTTP get to get the key back. And this uh, supports Custodia, by the way, which has this API, which is one of those other projects in LapSet, and it's interesting in its own right, so go see it. Uh, Clevis has minimal dependencies, and then each plugin can add its own dependencies, right? So we, we want this to be very, very flexible. Uh, we have early boot integration, which I'm going to show you a demo of. We have GNOME integration, which I'm not going to show you a demo of. Uh, and um, the, both of these are in progress. They actually work. Uh, but I made some core changes and broke some stuff, and so they currently don't work, but they will work again very shortly. Um, so let's look at a demo. And unfortunately, this always wants to drop me to the lowest resolution. Mm -hmm. So on the right-hand side, we have what's essentially the server, and on the left-hand side, we have a client that's in a virtual machine. You'll notice that we're booting up on the left, and it's going to require a password. On the right, we're going to set up uh, a tag server. This is actually some older code, uh, so it doesn't look exactly like this, but you'll get the general idea of the workflow. Uh, so we just uh, generate some keys and start the server over here. We've typed in the password over here to boot. <coughs> so here we're generating some keys. And now the server side is ready. We brought this is from scratch, by the way, from Young install. And then um, on the left, left side, we're going to install the client integration, including the uh, early boot integration. And then uh, we're going to bind the uh, data, the, the Lux partition, to uh, the, the tag server. And I just got the IP address for it over here. So it shows you the key and asks you if you want to accept. You type an existing Lux password. And now our disk is bound. On the left, on the right side, we'll show you now that the server is actually running. It started automatically with, with system B. I think we turn it off to show that it will actually turn back on when we re reboot. So now we reboot on the left. You'll notice that the password prompt comes up, but I don't type anything. The server started, it processes the key, and boots automatically. So now we're booted, and now you'll, you'll notice I completely stop the service and the socket, reboot it again, and now I won't type anything, and it will just hang and wait there because it can't contact the server. So in this case, you can, of course, fall back to the password. <coughs> when I typed in the password, I think it is going. So that's just a, a really, really simple demo of, of the technology we're making. Let's talk uh, two more things. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the dependencies that we're using because we've, we've had to build some infrastructure for this project. Uh, the first dependency is our larger one, and uh, it in turn depends on just OpenSSL because we don't implement our own crypto, right? That's the number one rule, don't implement your own crypto. And uh, so we depend on OpenSSL in Jose, and we depend on um, uh, Zlib for G for uh, GZIP encryption, so it's part of the standard. And basically, this is just a library that provides uh, JSON object signing and encryption. It's a C language library, so it's very low level, again, no dependencies. Uh, and we also have this really cool command line utility, which I'm really proud of. And this is just simply user-friendly crypto. Okay, so here's an example of using the, uh, the command line utility. So we echo this message, hi, uh, we pipe it into Jose. We're going to encrypt. We're going to take our input on standard in. We're going to use this RSA public key. We are going to output the message into this file. That's it. We just encrypted the message. Now we're going to decrypt it over here. So Jose again, decrypt. The input is the same output file. And this time we're using the RSA private key uh, in order to decrypt it. And we get the message back. Now we try the same thing with a different key and a different key. Right, so you can, uh, you, using this utility, you can um, 
generate keys automatically, you can perform encryption, you can perform decryption, you can perform signing and verification, uh, all using the standard JSON object. It's really simple to use. Uh, but not only is it really simple to use, you can actually control all of the parameters with it if you want, so it's both simple and powerful. What is that, that message.jwd? I mean, does it look like a... Like it's a it's just a JSON. Like it's a JSON object. Okay. okay. Um, so it's a binary file, or it's no, no. It's 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 text. It's, text. Okay. Uh, it's a text file that contains JSON, and then some of the uh, attributes of the JSON object are base sixty four encoded because they're binary. Okay. That's basically it. It's just metadata, and uh, for the binary stuff, it's base sixty four. Uh, this is all standard. Uh, I'm not inventing this myself. Right. Uh, there's a set of, I think it's seven RFCs that implement all of these objects and exactly what they're supposed to look like, how the algorithms are supposed to work. This is one of the best standards to come out of Microsoft in recent years. It's really fantastic. So, uh, so anyway, if you want easy crypto, right there. Uh, another dependency uh, is a project called LuxMeta. And the problem that we had is we need to store metadata about the keys, where we get them, things like that. Uh, but we need that stored on the disk before we decrypt the disk because we have to be able to access it. The problem is the vast majority of people have already deployed their disk using Lux, taking up the entirety of the block disk, right? So we needed to have somewhere to put this metadata. And fortunately for us, there's a gap in the Lux1 header. Uh, basically, you have uh, the Lux1 metadata, then you have the key slots, then there's a gap, and then you have the start of the encrypted data. So I created this library called LuxMeta, and basically what it does is it allows you to put stuff in that gap. Uh, and it's also very easy to use. It's also a C library with a command line utility. You can use this completely independently of all the stuff we've talked about. Just a quick example, we're going to echo some metadata and our message hi. Uh, you into LuxMeta to save it on this device, slot two, with this UUID. And this UUID is just randomly generated. It identifies, uh, hopefully in a collision-proof way, the, well, the contents of what's in slot two now. Okay? <coughs> so then, in the, second in the second command, we load that data back out, same device, same slot, same UUID, and we get the data back. Uh, however, if we, uh, if we try to get the same slot with a different UUID, it tells us the slot contains a different UUID and it won't give us the data back. It's just to protect it, right? So you can say, I'm expecting this kind of data in this slot and if everything matches, you get data back, if not in this. So fairly simple, fairly idiot proof. Okay. <coughs> and so that UUID would be something that would be gotten back from the Tang server or? No, it's just randomly generated for uh, it's essentially a type identifier for whatever metadata you're storing. Okay, okay so you, I as, as Clevis uh, am going to store some metadata, okay? I define my format, I randomly generate a UUID that indicates that the metadata is that format. And so then I always use that UUID when reading and writing the metadata and uh, I'm always guaranteed, essentially, unless there's a collision, which is extremely unlikely given the UUID, um, uh, it's basically impossible. So yeah, it, it uniquely identifies the type of data. So as long as the data in that slot has that UUID, I know it's my data and not somebody else's. So, so and then this, of course, is useful apart from the other projects. You can store your own data there if you want to do a different unlocking scheme. So this is where our terminology comes from. Uh, this is uh, your standard sort of binding uh, mechanic. People use this. Uh, the same mechanic was used in ancient handcuffs. Uh, and the, the U-shaped part is the clevis. The thing it binds to is the tag. And plugins, by the way, for clevis are called pins. Uh, so that's where the that's where the tag terminology comes from. Any questions? I think I've killed all of you with math. Uh, that's very <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, what are the problems that we're going to have with the file system? Yes. Is it going to be using micro that? Uh, it should be because all of those distributed file systems are built on top of a block device. And so you would just do Lux encryption underneath the block device and the distributed file system on top of it. So that's the way Gluster works, for instance. 
It depends. Um, it depends on the profile that you used when you created the Lux header. So, for instance, if you use uh, 256 bit keys, uh, it's fairly large. If you use 512 bit keys, it's fairly small. Uh, but you can also adjust uh, the size of the gap by just specifying a parameter when you're provisioning the system. So, if you know ahead of time you want to have a pretty, com a pretty complex policy, you can just shift the encrypted data right when you provision it. So the idea is, yes, we are somewhat constrained for some default de deployments, including RHEL 7 uh, and probably recent Fedoras, uh, because they're all using 512-bit keys now. Um, but uh, for users who want to plan ahead, they can get more space if they want. Um, Lux version 2 is also in planning right now, and there's some preliminary code. And they actually plan to have a dedicated JSON storage area. Uh, so you notice that our use of JSON uh, matches very tightly with their use of JSON. And that's because uh, should you know we see Lux version 2 in the near future, we can hopefully port to that and then just use that area and not use, need to use Lux Meta at all. But, it, but Lux Meta does provide us compatibility with Lux V1. So <coughs> there's also some other interesting use, uses uh, for this. Um, one, of the, one of the ideas I like which is a little bit controversial. It depends on whether you like ext4 encryption or not. So the ext4, Google implemented encryption on the file system level, which means you can actually uh, encrypt directories in inside of ext4. Uh, and I would like to store metadata in a, an extended attribute, which again would be a fairly limited size. But if we can store that in the extended attribute, uh, then we can automatically unlock, say, a directory. Uh, interestingly, we can unlock it in a namespace so, and then start a process in that namespace. So say uh, you have a database, you can encrypt the directory, automatically unlock it when the database starts, and only the database process sees uh, the unlocked directory. So various other ideas like that. Uh, Obviously, the full disk encryption is what we're targeting first because that's what most people are using. Uh, but this is flexible key management. So it can be deployed to a lot of other areas that aren't disk encryption as well. So for example, you can use this to deliver the uh, application-specific keys yes. to the actual application instead of bonding them to the source code. Correct. Yeah, so you don't, you don't have to commit your uh, passwords to the, your configuration files in, in Git. Uh, you can just use this to automatically recover them. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you.